Hello, my name is Peter Jordan. Welcome to United with Christ. We're going to have a great time today as we encourage and equip the saints with this local program here in El Paso, Texas. Today we're going to be talking about that it's time to share. We say that phrase a lot to our kids. We need to share, but what does that mean for us as adults and for those in the kingdom? So what does that mean? We're going to talk about that today. Welcome again to United with Christ. Don't go anywhere. United with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Welcome to United with Christ. My name is Peter Jordan. I'm a local pastor here in El Paso, Texas. This is a program where we try to encourage each other in the body of Christ through the teaching of His Word and through the encouragement of our, the testimony of the saints. So welcome. Uh, if you're going through anything particularly right now, we'd love to join with you in prayer. The prayer line is 915-532-8518. Encourage you, whatever's going on in your life, Praise report, something heavy, something not heavy. So maybe you're interceding and fasting for a loved one or a friend or a breakthrough in someone's life. We encourage you, join us in prayer and let us join with you as we participate together. That's what our, that's what our Lord has taught us, right? That we participate in this entire kingdom together. So today we're going to be discussing um, this concept that it's time to share. I have four kiddos. Uh, at one point, I had four kids under four years old, uh, a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and two sets of twin, uh, a set of twin boys. And we used to say the phrase very often, many times, okay, guys, share. It's share. Let's share. Um, and obviously, if you ever have little ones or ever worked with little ones, we tend to say that phrase a lot. But we want to go a little bit deeper than just sharing a toy <laughs> um, in, in this concept. And we're going to talk... Um, a little bit what John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3. We're also going to talk about what Jesus has asked us to do in participating in how we share in the kingdom and things like that. So first, let's start off with prayer and let's ask the Lord to give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Jesus, we are so grateful for the opportunity today to love you and to love your people, to participate in this great family you've created. Thanks for this chance. Jesus, we ask, God, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Let us be able to see, by having eyes that can see, the needs around us and the opportunities before us, and to be good stewards of all things that you've given to us. The things that you've entrusted to us, Lord, we want to return to you like the good servants did when you returned they returned all that you had given them and stewarded them. And we want to do the same, God. So Jesus, we ask God that you would open our eyes to see. In your name we pray. Amen. Not everybody understands this, but I have um, this concept about sharing what you have. So I'm going to try to break it down a little bit, and then um, we're going to try to encourage each other to, to push through it. So in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were created, and they were given this great, huge garden. And they were instructed to be fruitful and multiply and subdue it. Now, being fruitful and multiply, yes, it does mean to procreate, have kiddos. But it also means to, to take the principle when God created every seed-bearing plant in the day five that we can multiply all things. We can multiply our work and we can see anytime we sow any seed, we're going to reap it. And Jesus goes on to explain all this about the sowing and reaping laws and we understand that concept. But it's, it's in our original DNA, it's our original instruction to be fruitful and multiply and to go and subdue the earth and anything that God's given us. Obviously, Adam and Eve didn't do a great job in being a good steward of the garden. And uh, a lot of us love to blame them. <laughs> but the truth is, we all have not been good stewards, right? We all have not been good stewards in lots of things uh, that God's given us. And we want to be the best stewards we possibly can in all things. 
Now, a lot of times in the church realm, we talk about the word stewardship has to do with finances. Well, finances is a big part in, in making sure that we pay the tithe and we give offerings and we support uh, the ministries. Those are huge and in part, uh, that's a huge part of our faith and on our kingdom. But when, when Jesus instructs the, the three different servants about um, when he gives a parable that he pulls a servant aside and gives one five talents, one three talents, one one talent, um, that is a measurement of, of, of money. We understand that. But the principle still applies in anything that God has given us, we are stewards of, right? We're stewards of that. So I'm a steward of having four kiddos because my wife and I decided to obey the rule, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth. And we have been uh, in, granted the stewardship to be parents of these four amazing, amazing kids. We've also been faithful with little things to where we were able to be honored, the, the privilege to be the, the lead pastors of our church, Paseo. And, and so we are stewards of that. I've also started, off, I've been at Salvation Army for the last decade, started off working in the maintenance uh, department because it was laid off our job in Chicago. And we had to be a good, faithful steward of that job in the maintenance department, moved on up to being an operations manager at the thrift store. And I'm a good, I have to be a steward of that, right? So everything that God's given us, we are stewards of. And a lot of people misinterpret some of this, and, and I just want to make sure that we uh, explain this pretty well, that our stewardship is not all, only the great things we have. It's not just our jobs. It's not just our resources. It's also the opportunity to be a steward of a difficult season. So when we all go through hard times, we all have the opportunity to be a good steward of that or a poor steward of that. So when we face particular things, we want to recognize that we have an opportunity to partner with the Lord and be a, a steward of those exact moments, or we can miss that. We can miss that part. And so today I really want to talk about this idea that it's time to share and that when we have the opportunity to share not just our finances and not just giving someone a ride because we have a car, but we can share our story. And I feel like that's something that a lot of us don't tend to do is we don't share our story really well. Or at least we don't share the whole story. I have a, uh, I was blessed to be one of four boys. Um, my parents had four boys. I was the second of four. My, my youngest brother, um, struggled with drug addiction at a very young age. And at one point, he told me uh, a difficult story of how he slipped up and he started using again. And uh, he was trying to confess and come clean. And I just felt the Spirit speak to me and just ask him, well, where'd you get the money for this particular time he slipped up? And he told me the 80% of the hard part of the truth by telling me he slipped up and you know he was using heroin again. He didn't want to use it. But that 20% that he held back was because he had stolen some things from our family to go sell it. And he'd gotten so high, he'd forgotten which pawn shop he had gone to. That was a really hard thing for him to say. But the, the, the truth is, um, the truth is everything that we are stewarded. So he can't just say 80% of it. You have to say all 100% of it. And so a lot of us tend to not share our entire story. But I want to encourage us that we are stewards, stewards of the, our entire story. And so when we have anything that God's given us. We are stewards of that. And so we have an opportunity to partner with the Lord, right? So we've all been instructed how to live right here. And we have the instructions of what God uh, says is, is a great way to live. And then this is a difficult way to live. And Jesus gives us all kinds of teachings. And now we're stewards of those revelations in order how to live. And so my encouragement to us today is uh, a handful of things we want to talk about sharing. First, I want you to consider sharing your story. And when I say your story, I want us to really recognize, is it really our story? Isn't it Christ in us, the hope of glory? Isn't it Christ in us that's redeemed us? Because the Son, who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's really His story, right? We're participating in His story. And so a lot of times people struggle with sharing particular parts of their life. My, so my encouragement to you and what I want you to be free is this. Every part of your life is under the cross. If you've put your past under the cross, your current part under the cross, if it has been redeemed, it's no longer your story. And so you no longer need to feel shame. You no longer need to feel shame. 
Because shame is a work and a tool of the enemy. When Adam and Eve missed it, right? And God is walking in the cool of the day to go find them. What did they do? They went and hid. And when he called them out, they felt ashamed. And then they started blaming, right? Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. And so those three things always tend to happen anytime we are outside of that presence of God. We shame, we blame, and we hide. So if there's hiding or shaming or blaming in any part of your story, I encourage you, bring it to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Talk to someone else that has a, in your church, maybe your pastor or another friend who understands following Jesus, and confess your sins to one another so you may be healed, is what James, chapter, uh, James teaches us. And the power of sin, in my teachings, in my understanding, the power of sin is in secrecy. So anytime that you confess, right? It's like sin had our, is bound. It has us right there. And we can't get rid of it. But as soon as you confess, as soon as you confess to Jesus, to the body of Christ, sin doesn't just automatically just leave. But that grip of sin right here, the power of sin. Is so if I remove that thumb right there, it's like confessing. It's like confessing. So then it's a whole lot easier to break loose from those old habits. So my encouragement is don't hold these things in your story. It's time to share those. It's time to share those. As, as James says, confess your sins to one another. And so my, I, I don't think you should be putting that on social media. I think that's a very poor choice. I don't think you should blast it to everybody. But go to some godly saints and say, this is an area of my life I feel still condemned. I still feel shamed. I still want to blame others. I want to hide from it. Those are the ways that the enemy um, tries to attack us. But what, what did God do with Adam and Eve? He called them out. He provided a covering for them. And when he provided a covering, then they could walk with him again. Now, granted, they did lose that stewardship of, garden, of the Garden of Eden, but God still walked them through the next part of their story. So my encouragement to you is to recognize it's time to share some of that. It's time to share part of your story. I, I, I'll, I'll just be upfront and honest. Since I was about eight, nine years old, I was introduced to porno pornography. And I grew up in a single family. Uh, my, my dad had lost his way. He came back into our, uh, into our lives later uh, a lot better. But during those formidable years as a young man, pornography just hooked me in. And man, it was so shameful and I, and I had such a hard time, but I didn't have a man walk me through that. And it wasn't until my married years when it, I, pornography was still attacking me and I was still grabbed by it that I finally go and seek help. Everyone else in my family had become either addicts to alcohol or drug abuse or something like that. For me, I didn't go down substances in that sense. I went through pornography. And I constantly felt shamed. I constantly felt like I needed to blame something, and I definitely was hiding. And so uh, seeking counsel, I found some really good marriage counselors, my wife and I, and it was very encouraging, and it helped um, set, it, it helped me get on the path to keep that freedom. Remember, it was nothing I did. It's Christ who sets us free. John chapter 8, uh, verse 35, who the Son sets free is free indeed. And I've been set free. But I could always choose to go back to that path of hiding, of blaming, and return to pornography. Obviously, that's not something I want. I don't want it in my own life. I don't want it in my marriage. I don't want to add that as an example to my, my kiddos. I'd rather stay free. And so my encouragement to us is don't feel you have to be shamed uh, in this but to let that go. So I feel like we are stewards of our story, but we're also stewards of anything else that God's given us. Family members who can drive us bonkers, neighbors who you just would love for them to leave, but for some reason God has placed them at this point in your life and this point in their life together. And so my encouragement to you is recognize the relationships you have, the jobs you have, all things in your life have been stewarded to you. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do with those obnoxious people? What are we going to do with those really frustrating times with family members? Holiday seasons are right around the corner, right? There tends to be a whole lot of tension, a whole lot of stress. How are you going to be a good steward of these holiday times with our families? So my encouragement to you is let, let's remember it's not just our past, but it's also our present. And also we're stewards of our future. The path that we're choosing to go, is it closer to Jesus? Is it closer to the saints? Hebrews chapter 10 talks about don't forsake the gathering of the saints like some have, have gotten the habit of doing. We need to continue to be uh, in the presence of saints, right? And I believe the Lord is constantly drawing those people to him. In fact, my wife and I uh, had a really great experience uh, just 
last month where uh, we were gathering together with some friends and family for a big art show for, for one of my, uh, for my uncle. And uh, lots of friends and family came. We were up out of town. But a particular guest that was there, uh, some dear friends that they're ministers for over 50 years. And uh, they were there and it just, it spoke, God spoke to my heart, spoke to my wife's heart, spoke to my uncle's heart, that they were so past burnout. They were at a point of, they were at a point of desperation. And so that night, uh, as we're all gathering together, uh, we had a bunch of Frito pies and enjoying it. And I ju- God just showed up and we started praying for them and we encouraged them. Um, and uh, just a handful of people just started giving offerings to help. These ministers had been ministering for 26 uh, years at one particular church, been in ministry over 50 years. And just one thing after another, just they were at a very difficult season and so they were at a breaking point, and they had an opportunity to lean in and participate in that opportunity, or they could have hid and felt shamed that they didn't have the finances in order to handle this difficult thing. But instead, they confessed it, and they leaned in the body of Christ. It was just such a cool moment. My kids got to witness that. My kids had actually been saving some money for some particular things, and God just moved in their heart. Uh, I have a 16-year-old daughter, a 15-year-old son, and twin boys that were 12, all four of them felt like I'm giving this. And they didn't even necessarily have had all the money. They wrote on a little piece of paper. They did a faith pledge to these, I'm going to give you this money. And little by little, they've been able to, to give that. Another person in the audience, in the audience, in that room, there was about maybe 25 people in that room, a lifelong friend. She had, God had already put in her heart that they need, she needed to help this family. And her husband had just passed away and she had the tithe, um, to give to them and their church. And it was just this huge blessing. And that check was already in their pocket before, in her pocket, before they even started confessing. God was doing some really cool stuff. And uh, as we were cleaning up that night, it was just this really great breakthrough in, in all things. And my wife was emptying the trash. And as she went outside to empty the trash, she, felt, she was just like, God, that was one of the coolest things. And she felt the Lord say to her, I'm redeeming my church. I'm calling her back to me. I'm, I'm wooing her back. And so uh, she said, oh, I want to be part of that. Can I, can I be part of that? And so my encouragement to all of us is let's be part of that. Let's be part of the wooing of uh, those in our lives who um, may be in a really bad breaking point. Now, he, now that pastor, his name was Pastor Tim, his wife, um, named Cheryl. They could have easily just stayed quiet and not shared. But because they stepped out in faith, The body of Christ is right there to support them and lean on them and to spur each other on in our good deeds, carry each other's burdens as the scriptures teach us. And that's exactly what happened. And so my encouragement to you is if you are on that end where it's really difficult, lean in and say something. If you're at that point, you're like, I wonder if the Holy Spirit's saying something, then lean in and just ask. If, if, I mean, what, what, if you, if you ask and it doesn't go good, then it's okay. You can let that stuff go. You're like, oh, I just, maybe I missed it. But at least you leaned in, you took a risk. You took a risk for the kingdom, right? But it was such a powerful moment. I've checked in with that pastor for the last month, and he said he just set free. His heart was so burnt out for so many years of ministry. He just he felt like he said he's lost his passion, but God renewed something in him because of the body of Christ. And so uh, my encouragement is lean in to say it yourself if you need help, if you, or if there's someone around, lean in and recognize you're a steward of that moment as well. So our time is something we're stewarded of. Our stories is something we're stewarded of. But we're also stewarded stuff, and we have a lot of stuff. And so working at the Salvation Army the last 10 years, um, we've had the opportunity to see how God can use stuff to really encourage someone's life. So let's say you really want to help out someone. Maybe you don't have 100 bucks or 1000 bucks to, to donate towards the Salvation Army, but you have a bag of clothes. Or maybe you have an old couch, and you're like, well, I want to help someone. What can I do? So the Salvation Army will go and pick those things up, bring it to our thrift store, and then at that thrift store, we'll be able to start helping lots of people. So our thrift store sells things at a decent price so people in that area can get a good product at a good price. But 100% of those proceeds go exactly to the ministry of Salvation Army. Every $25 we spend at the thrift store feeds someone at our shelter for a week. And so we thought it's a really important time uh, this time of year as, as uh, the holidays are right here and people are buying new stuff. What do I do with our old stuff? We wanted to talk about what can you be, what can you do, with that and how do you be a good steward so i brought with me a a good friend of mine a a guest here she is the manager for the salvation army's family thrift store this is bonnie hi bonnie hi p 
Peter. How are you? Good. 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 Thanks for being here. And we're going to talk about thrift store. Is that cool? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, cool. All right. So let's say someone um, says, I have, um, I have maybe some old clothes. I have an old dining table. Um, I mean, what, what stuff can you use? And if they call and they ask you that, what do you usually say? What kind of stuff can you use? Well, when they do call the store and I answer and they're telling me items that they want to donate, I first ask them, what is it, uh, what condition it's in, is it torn, is it stained. Unfortunately, sometimes we do get bed bugs in furniture, so those things we do have to uh, So those are the things that we don't take, That right? we don't yeah, take. Yeah, so mm -hmm. because sometimes when people want to... Uh, Maybe they're cleaning out their house like, oh, I have all this old junk. Uh, I'll just call Salvation and I'll come get it, right? Well, that's not very prudent or very helpful for us. No, right? it's not. Right? Because that's going to cost us, right? Um, because uh, they just really want to dump the stuff. Now, what we want to do, what, what, so we, we want things in good condition that, that, that doesn't need repair. But what, what are those particular items that we're looking for? We take furniture, of course, couches, uh, refrigerators, stoves, uh, Dining room tables, clothing is our main thing that we do sell at the okay. store. Clothing. Uh, because we do get uh, people that need clothing, yep. especially right now that it's cold. People are looking for jackets and shoes yep. and the little ones that need items. So to me, I feel very privileged and being able to offer a shirt for two, three dollars yep. because yep. I know that they can that they, they'll be able to afford that for their child. Yep. Um, another thing that I love that I do is that if there's a person, a family that is really in need, mm -hmm. we call the shelter and we explain this is what's going on. Can, can you yeah, help Yeah, they go us? through the voucher program, We go right? through yeah. the voucher, which is such a wonderful program because with that voucher, they come in and they get clothing. Yep. Or furniture, or whatever, furniture, whatever, whatever it is. To pay for it. Exactly. Wow, and that's so and that's very fulfilling when I see someone, and we've seen that at the store so many times, when we see someone that hit rock bottom, that is trying to better their mm -hmm. lives, mm -hmm. and we provide a All full the, the, household the that they, have to have. That they yeah. need. I, I mean... Uh, some of our employees are so grateful, so they have such a big heart right. uh, that even we bring stuff from home. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, because yep. unfortunately, you know, TVs, uh, it is an entertainment, and we've had a TV donated to our, our employees that are getting out of their sure, heart sure. life. Yeah. So it's just wonderful to see that. It's wonderful to see people uh, go out the door with items that they need. Sure. Blankets. Uh, I have such a great team that sometimes even the team will step in and buy stuff. Right. For someone else. For who somebody shows up, else right? that yeah. shows up Absolutely. because we are great. We are very, very blessed. You know, we have a home that we get to go home to. We have. Yep. Yeah. We, we've, we we've, we've been that. stewarded so much. Yes, right? we have. Yeah. You know, we don't have just one pair of shoes. We may have five pairs of That's shoes. Right. That's right. Like me. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So actually in, in. In Luke chapter 3, uh, some folks go to John the Baptist because they're like, okay, look, I want to change. I want to I do the things the right way, right? And they say, um, well, what should we do, right? So John chapter 11, I think this is a really great uh, verse that we say a lot at the Salvation Army. It says, the man with two shirts should share with him who has none. Pretty simple, right? right. And the one who has food should do the same. And really, that's what Salvation Army does. We've talked a lot about that the shelter provides a whole lot of uh, food, right? 240,000 meals a year, right? But we also, the thrift store itself is the thing that helps fund all of that, right? And, and so if you've got two shirts, scriptures say, if you've got two, share with one, right? And uh, I know um, over the last decade, we've said this phrase, if it, um, so if someone comes and they need something, they'll see our social services. We do some screening just to make sure we're not being scammed. And then um, they, they go there, they go shopping for free. So either it's going to go on their backs, right, or we're going to sell it, and it's going to go in their bellies because that's what's going to fund, uh, mm. fund that for you. Absolutely. So let's say someone's like, hey, I didn't know you guys had a three. So you're not Goodwill. No. Not Goodwill. We do something very different, right? We very give, different. We give everything away. About one out of every three shirts, we just give away. The other two, we try to sell in order to pay for the food. But So let's, let, let me ask you, if someone's like, huh, that's pretty cool. Um, so where is your thrift store? Where is the thrift store for the Salvation Army? The thrift store is located at 
3920 Moorhead. We're mm. right in the corner of Moorhead and Dyer. Okay, right, right by across, Chico's Tacos. Right yep. across Chico's Tacos, yeah. our favorite place. So let's say someone goes, hey, I would love to come volunteer. What are just a handful of things some volunteers can do? Oh my gosh, we need so many volunteers at the store. We need volunteers from sweeping okay. to sorting okay. to helping clean up the yard, okay. going through all those donations yeah. to bailing to sometimes just helping us with the customers. Sure. So because, there's a variety of everything oh, that we yes. can do. Yeah. Yes. So when we get clothing, we get things like that, we want to sort it. And, and we don't want to put things out there that are subpar, right? Because these folks are coming out of the shelter. They're already struggling with their dignity. They're trying to get on their feet. And that's why we ask for certain donations to not be subpar, right? If they're pretty ratty, they're pretty rough, and, and we say to ourselves, oh, the poor would like it, recognize this. Jesus said... Let's give the, give to the poor as if you're giving it to me. So if you feel like your donation is something really nice and you would give it to Jesus, then call the Salvation Army. 915-565-6532. That schedules the pickup. But if you know it's pretty rough, then my encouragement to you is just let that go. Let that go. Call, go and get it dumped and things like that. And that way it doesn't have to be so much pressure on pressure on us. So, um, well, Bonnie, we're about to wrap up. Any particular uh, items that we're always looking for? I know we haven't had a car donated in a while. Any we other particular had, things? Uh, cars, um, appliances, okay, washers, well, yeah. dryers. If you're going to switch them out at Christmas time, give us a call. We'll yes, take it. Yes, yeah. please give us a call because, you know, um, a uh, perfect example, a young, uh, an elderly couple needed a washer and dryer. Right, 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 right. We had one. $500. Oh, that's awesome. And we've got it. So we want to say thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for watching United with Christ. May God bless you. And throughout the Christmas season, recognize it's time to share. All things that God's through you, share it. Your story, your stuff, your time. We love you. God bless you.